ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host, Kerrigan. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Welcome to Witch God. Wow. Welcome to Witch Talk. Uh, my name is Kerrigan, and this is a very, very special show because we have uh, an amazing guest. We always have amazing guests. I always say the same thing every time we talk about this. I mean, the introduction is always the same. It's an, always an amazing guest, but it is. Um, and we do, uh, we do have amazing guests because we want to learn from them, and we want them to share very kindly their wisdom and um, their uh, legacy, their books, and what is going on right now in their lives because there are actually extraordinary people. Now, before we go anywhere, um, let me just show you a little bit of um, you know our website. And I always do this. <laughs> and I have to kind of uh, show you all of this. So uh, Facebook is one of our uh, pages on Facebook, Witch Talk. You know that we reach almost um, uh, 90,000 people all over the world. It's 80,000 80, something. So um, it's very nice. Uh, we do speak in English most of the time. Uh, before we t we did we did actually talked in Portuguese. We we did a couple of uh, shows in Portuguese. So um, the thing is that you can go on Witch Talk and click on Ustream Live, and you can actually be um, uh, direct from uh, Facebook with us and uh, you can be on the chat room you can watch the show it's just the whole thing it's really really good now um, another thing that I wanted to show you uh, is um, something that I just find out uh, Z Budapest and let me just go here on Z um, website and this is her page on uh, on uh, Facebook Z Budapest will have a fantastic show called Z Life and she will be on the air very very soon with her uh, show and I'm very excited about that because we really want uh, I mean Z has a lot to say about you know a lot of things and, and I'm sure that this is going to be a very very good show and it's a new stream also so you can actually go and access, uh, access from, from her page or from the page of the of the show and it's absolutely amazing I don't have the whole details but you know um, it's going to be absolutely amazing uh, she will have the same thing as we do she will have like a little button here which, which says you stream live and you can access actually access from uh, the page on Facebook so it's very direct it's wonderful and uh, very very soon you will have Z Budapest live on Ustream it's amazing I just love it so then don't forget that we have the Witch Talk Traveler which is a new way of Witch Talk a new way of doing Witch Talk and it's absolutely amazing because we do have some interviews that we wanted to do with people um, and sometimes we're not on the studio so we just go uh, right ahead and uh, do the interview live from uh, Witch Talk Traveler so that's that's another thing um, let me just uh, tell you how you can contact us on Witch Talk and we'll be right back here we go so you want to know how to keep in touch with everything Witch Talk go to www.witchtalkshow.com and follow all the latest news listen directly to the show and enjoy it don't forget that all episodes of Witch Talk will be available to you on demand on Ustream. Click on Twitter, Facebook or Google Plus on our own Ustream page and spread the word. Don't forget to join us on Ustream Crowd. Go to www.ustream.tv slash channel slash witchtalk dash show. Do you want to be part of the show? Join our incredible conversations live on every show right here on Witch Talk. Witch Talk will air every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or approximately 9 p.m. in most Europe. Now live in video, watch us on Ustream. Follow us on Twitter at Carrigan, K-H-A-R-A-G-A-N with an H after the K. Or send us an email at witchtalkshow at gmail.com. Now back to the show.
And back to the show, it is. Here I am. We are going to actually begin to introduce our guest today. Uh, she's amazing. Let's just say that. Um, she's the author of uh, many, many books. She's a Gardnerian high priestess. And we're going to talk about traditional Wicca. We're going to talk about her books and her travelers to Brazil um, and uh, what she shares there with the community of Brazil. I mean, it's going to be a fantastic show. So before we go there, let me just um, introduce you to her. And then we'll go right into the interview. Don't forget that you can actually ask questions. This is the opportunity for you to ask questions to these amazing authors. I mean, it's just direct. You just have to be on the chat room and ask the questions, okay? Um, so we're going to introduce her and we'll be right back. Here we go. Deborah Lipp is the author of five books, The Study of Witchcraft, Elements of Ritual, The Way of Four, The Way of Four Spellbook. Deborah became a gardener and witch in 1982 and a high priestess in 1986 and has been teaching Wicca and running pagan circles ever since. She's been published in many pagan publications including New Witch, The Llewellyn Magical Almanac, Pangaea, Green Egg and The Druid's Progress as well as Mothering Magazine. She's also a lifetime member of ADF and was on the original board of directors of that organization. She has lectured at numerous pagan festivals in a variety of topics. As an active out-of-the-closet member of the pagan community, Barbara has appeared in various media discussions of Wicca, most notably on the A&E documentary Ancient Mysteries, Witchcraft in America. She has also appeared on MSNBC, in the New York Times, and in many smaller TV and print sources. In real life, Deborah is a technical writer. She lives in Rockland County, New York, with her son Arthur and their cats Mingo and Fanti. Deborah reads and teaches tarot, designs wire and bead jewelry, solves and designs puzzles, watches old movies, hand paints furniture, and dabbles in numerous handcrafts. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my guest today on Witch Talk, Deborah Lip. <laughs> welcome, Deborah. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's wonderful to have you here. This is this is amazing cuz this is kind of a I always wanted to have you on the show. And uh you are, you were actually in in Brazil with with uh, Jamal and um and I said to Jamal, you know, why don't you invite her on the show? <laughs> and it just happened. It just happened. It's absolutely amazing. I just love it. How are you? I'm great. It's a beautiful Sunday and I'm having a lovely time. It is. It is. It's wonderful. Okay. So uh, one of the first things that I want to ask you, and and you know I ask you that I ask this for for um, for every every guest that I have. It's um, when did you begin? I I want to know a little bit more about you because we know that Deborah Lip is the author. She's she's a high priestess, you know, of the Gardner and tradition, all of that. But I want to know before that. So I want to know when did you begin? Were you a weird child? Because I was a weird child. You know what oh, I mean? This, this. <laughs> I'll tell you what. And, and this is really, this is funny because I just finished writing uh, an autobiography, which will be out next year. And oh, yeah, so I've been yeah. going through all my old diaries and, yes. you know, <laughs> sort of researching myself. Yes. And um, I was, what I was was a very, very spiritual, very religious child. And, and in fact, um, my mother said that by the time I was like four years old, she knew that I had deep religious needs that she didn't know how to meet because she's very agnostic and she's very disinterested in religion. Yeah. So my first religious love was Judaism. And I sort of threw myself into it, you know, passionately. Yes. Um, I wanted to figure out a way of living a religious life. Yes. 
But this was the early 70s, and I started to realize that there wasn't a place for women, um, who a feminist place. A, a yes. truly equal place for women in in Judaism. I've I've joked with my mother, you know, who has really come to accept and embrace me <laughs> as a as a priestess and and yeah. as a as a Wiccan. Uh, but I joke with her, you know, Mom, if they had female rabbis when I was growing up, everything might have been different. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which they are right now. I mean, they're not, they are, they're not, they're not orthodox, not, but yeah, yeah. No, not orthodox, but there yeah. was no female rabbis until the mid-80s. So yeah, that's true, I, I yeah. was already well on my path by then. Um, yeah. When I was, so so when I was like 12 years old, I realized that Judaism was not a good, was not the right fit for me. I, yes. I, my orientation was more goddess. I was more female-centric. I was very interested in the Greek myths, which were all taught in school, yes. and um, so that was my language. Yeah. You know, that was the only language I had for for the gods at that time. Mm -hmm. But literally, when I was 13 years old, I started sneaking out of the house at night, secretly worshipping the moon. Wow. That's amazing. And I thought I was the only one in the world. I didn't know <laughs> that there were pagans doing this. I thought it was just me. Yes, 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 yes. When did you find out that there were others? Did you find well, out about like... a yeah? Go about ahead. a year later, I was um, now. This was so. This is 1975. Yes, maybe. And I'm in a health food store. Yes. And um, there's a little hippie town, and there's a little newsletter uh, yes. by the register, and it was a little feminist newsletter, and in it they talk about doing a salmon ritual, and. Um, I, I think it must have said Halloween. I don't remember. I, some, some details of the ritual I actually still remember, but there was no contact information. Yes. Um, so I couldn't, I couldn't I, there was no address, there was no P.O. box, there was no phone, there was nothing. And, and the next time I went back to that store, nobody knew what I was talking about, but it lit a fire in me because I knew there were others. Yes. And I didn't stop looking until I found actually the coven that I was initiated into, which took, uh, you know, I found that group in 1981. Um, and there was a whole journey on that road in those, in between those years, but, but that was the beginning for me. Yes, yes. So you you were never exposed to any other type of tradition. I mean, you were never exposed. I mean, you were very. You, you actually jumped into it right away. The coven that you t that took you at the time was a Gardnerian coven. So you didn't know. Did you know at the time that there were other traditions on traditional uh, itchcraft or not? The first book I read was Drawing Down the Moon by Marco Adler. Yes. And. I mean, one of the things that would happen is I would go into bookstores and I would look at all the books and I would I would be repulsed by this feeling that I was being conned, you know, that yes, that it was yes. all sort of people was it was, it was going to be fake and and people were going to be selling me a bunch of garbage. Mm -hmm. But I used to listen to Margot on the radio. Yes. So um, uh, my my mother. <laughs> <laughs> is a huge fan of talk radio, and yes. and Margot had a radio show on WBAI Radio in New York. Yes. It was on in the afternoons around three o'clock, so it would be on the radio when I came home from school. And so when, perfect when timing. I saw that, <laughs> perfect, right? So so yeah. when I saw that Margot had written a book, I this was somebody I knew. This was somebody I trusted. Yes. 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 So so finally, I did not feel frightened to buy this book. Yes. So I bought this book, and I read all about, I mean, if you haven't read Drawing Down the Moon, it covers, the purpose of it is to cover the diversity of the pagan community. Yes. There are eclectics, there are kitchen witches, there are Gardnerians and Alexandrians, there are Druids, there, there's Church of All Worlds, there's, there's uh, some, I think there's Egyptian Reconstructionists in there, there's, yes. there's a whole range and it was yeah. very clear to me, reading that book, that what resonated with me was the Gardnerian tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was, in that edition, that was, I believe, the second edition of, of Drawing Down the Moon, and um, there, there were, was an extensive interview with a Gardnerian named Lady Theos in that book. Mm -hmm. And in that edition, there was a P.O. box in the back where you could write to her. 
um, and I wrote to her. Yeah. And she <laughs> for, forwarded my letter to a priestess in New Jersey because, you know, who was an hour and a half away from me. But, you know, if you're in Long Island, then you think all of New Jersey is one. It's one and the same. They're all neighbors, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah. That, that group that she forwarded that letter to, that was the only group that I was ever in. That was where I trained. That was where I initiated. That was the group that I stayed with until I I hyped off and formed my own. That's amazing. That's a you know that's a very straightforward. I mean, there's a, you know there's no doubt. Here it is. <laughs> here is I where I belong, and here is where I want to be. And it's it's a it's very straightforward. It's a very you know that's very interesting. Did you I know ever... a lot of people. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I know a lot of people go through such twisted paths, and they get in seven that's different why, groups. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm very, why, I'm very blessed. I'm very grateful. I know, I know. I'm kind of like, wow. All right. So, um, you, 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 you trained with that coven. You, you've hyped off, and and uh, we're we're talking about eighty eighty six. Is that it? Eighty six. When you I have, started yeah, my own when group you have, in Queens, yes. New York. Now we all know that the eighties were the booming on the you know late late seventies um, you know and the eighties were the was the boom of literature. So we're beginning to do you know we're beginning to see Margaret Adler. Uh, we're also beginning to see uh, Scott Cunningham, and then you know all of those all of those people that really populated the the publishing world with with a lot of books that you know and then and then comes you know uh, Raymond Bookland and all of that the Blue Book which we all the door and all of that and and um Wicca as we as as you knew it um at that time uh, pr- probably began to take you know the, the the definition of Wicca began to take a different form did it didn't it well yes i was i was in fact um when i was training not mm-hmm. allowed to call myself a witch Yes. Until I was initiated, of course, and yeah. a, a, and within the Gardnerian tradition, that is the definition. You yes. are not a witch. You are not a Wiccan until you are an initiate. Yes. And but I'm also a writer, and as a writer, and as a person for whom language is my primary tool and my mm-hmm. primary love, yes, um, I understand that language changes. And what I always say is, okay, use modifiers. You know, you can't just say Wicca is ah. What you can say is traditional Wicca is versus yes. eclectic Wicca is, yes. and so on. And then you can start to form um, a more clear definition. Now, there are, there are still people who say that an eclectic Wiccan isn't really a Wiccan. Well, this is a language argument. This is not, this is not saying that their path isn't valid. It's an argument over semantics. And it's yes. time, I feel... And I'm sure, you know, people are going to get pitchforks and torches, but I feel it's time for those of us who are traditional to just give up and acknowledge that we have lost that battle. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Now, I have I have Kyar Serif, and you probably know him um, from ADA. I, I didn't hear you have who? K- K- Kyar Serif. Um, he's from. Um, he worked with ADF, and he. I think he worked a lot with ADF, and he was part of the. You know, of the council, as you were also. You were a lifetime, right, member of the ADF. I and, recently um, resigned my lifetime membership. Um, you did? Oh. Yes, I did. Uh, but it's it's <laughs> fine. We we just we just parted ways amicably. All right, that's. I good. was a okay. lifetime member. I I paid for a lifetime membership, but. It, it was time to part ways amicably. Okay, okay, okay. So, but he told he came up with this term, and I'm going to tell you, and you're going to tell me, oh well, it's semantics. But he actually said that there is Wicca, and there is no Wicca. Now, this is, a, uh, I think, an attempt of his part uh, um, of of recovering that term. Um, to the traditional Wicca, because he said, you know, Wicca is Gardnerian Wicca, Alexandrian Wicca, traditional Wicca, and then Neo Wicca is something that began to, you know, appear later on, and that's what it's defined as Neo Wicca. Do you agree with this? Well, it's here's the thing: is it's a it's a good attempt at at <laughs> offering this definition, but but it won't fly. People who are eclectic who want to call themselves Wiccan are not going to stop and start calling themselves Neo-Wiccan because <laughs> yeah. 
and and that, that is what I mean. Is sometimes the language gets away from you. You know, it's it's sort of like I suppose if you were a psychiatrist, yes, watching people go around saying, "Oh, this is so crazy." And trying to convince them not to use the word crazy to mean anything but a psychiatric diagnosis. Yes. You know, the psychiatrist is right, but you can't win that argument. <laughs> I know, I know. So, I know. so just stop trying. You know, it's I fine. Know, I know, I know, because what we do is so much more important than whether or not we use that word. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, um, to get back to one of the, the latest books that you actually put out, which is absolutely amazing. I just, uh, I really love this book. It's uh, called The Study of Witchcraft, a guide, a guidebook to advance Wicca, and we have it here. It's absolutely amazing. Now, there are two... I'm, I'm going to play the dumb, all right? There are two Fine. things that you're, you're, you're kind of like putting on these titles. You're using A Study of Witchcraft, and then you say A Guidebook to Advance Wicca, so, um, why did you use Wicca and then you use witchcraft on the on the main title? Isn't isn't that the same thing, or are they th different things? Um, they are overlapping things. They are okay. different but overlapping things. Um, okay. There are there are witches who are not Wiccan. I would okay. I, I I do not think. I am sure that there are eclectic Wiccans who will say, "Well, I'm not a witch," but I do not think that that's correct. I think that a Wiccan is a wi is is a kind of witch. Uh -huh, uh -huh, you know, it's uh -huh. it's what Isaac Bonowitz called neo pagan witchcraft. Wicca is defined as neo pagan witchcraft. Now, yes. therefore, there are other kinds of of um, witches who are not neo pagan or who are not following the the underlying religious structure of Wicca. Because whether you're traditional or whether you're eclectic, there are certain things that Wiccans always do. Right? We cast yes. circles, we call quarters, we have eight holidays, we have four elements, or sometimes five. Mm -hmm. we, um, we plan our circles around the lunar cycle. If we're not doing those things, and that's pretty minimum definition, we're yeah, duotheistic. Yes. yes. If we are not following that minimum, I would say you're not Wiccan. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, it's it's a good it's a good thing that someone will say this because <laughs> you know people said no I don't care what she says I'm a Wiccan and that's it well that's fine for you but it, there is there is there has to be someone Deborah that puts out the definition of what is considered to be a Wiccan you know what I mean because there's so many and I you know people can be whatever they want that's fine but but there are some things that you have to have in a cake in order to call it a cake. If Absolutely. you don't have, you know what I mean? <laughs> Here, there, here's a fundamental principle, and this is very important. It's called words mean things. Words yes. mean things. If everything yes. it means the same as everything else, we can't speak. Yes. yes. And yes. if you are practicing a system in which you do not cast circles, but you rather have an open ritual space, and you do not use four elements, you you and you um, have seven gods on your altar, and you know what? It could be all beautiful. Wicca doesn't hold the keys to the kingdom, so people should stop struggling to be Wicca if that's not right for them. There's lots of wonderful things in paganism that you can be other than Wiccan. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's it's a wonderful world. It's a wonderful world. And now, diversity this, is beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. It's really good. It's it's absolutely and it's necessary. You know, I think that it really is necessary. Now, one of the things that I really like about this book, uh, and we're going to talk about it very specifically, but one of the things that I like about it is the recommended reading that you put in the end of each chapter. It's absolutely amazing. You do direct the reader to further reading, um, and it's a wonderful. I mean, I would, I would just, I'm, you know, you don't really need anything else but <laughs> this list of, you know, of of recommended readings. It's amazing. Now, this is very necessary because you don't really, you know, people don't really do this. This is very generous of you, I think. You know, people just stay in their own book. They really don't further anything else. You know what I mean? And this is very generous of you because this is it tells me as a reader that you really kind of you know um, care about your readers 
it's I I mean this book as a self study <laughs> guide and 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 yes you know many many people who who wish to be Wiccan are isolated. Uh, maybe they're young, and maybe they're in the closet, or maybe they live in remote areas or areas where there aren't a lot of um, open pagan resources, or for whatever reason. Um, that the single most frequent letter that I used to get from people is, "Okay, what do I do next? I've read about the eight holidays, and I and I've read about this, and I've read about that. You know, all that Wicca one on stuff. Now, what do I do? Now, what do I do? And I wrote yeah. this book for those people, and. Originally, I was asked to put more teaching in the book, and I refused, because this is a book for people to take and learn themselves, not learn what I have to tell them, but yes. put together a study program for themselves that suits their needs, that fires their passions, and that turns them into a well-educated witch. Yes, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. And it really shows. Now, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about on this book, and there is one um, on Chapter 2 on Modern Wicca Described, you do have a sub a sub chapter that it's called, well, a subsection there that is called Wicca as a Structured traditionalis Traditionalism. And what you say is what we can share, and this is very important because you already said, you know, there's a couple of things that we do share, um, is polarity, immanence, nature, magic, circles, and quarters. Why is yep. polarity important? Polarity is um, one of the one of the primary energies of of the universe. Polarity um, is is one of the primary ways in which we get power. And traditional Wiccan ritual is structured around gaining power from polarity. Um, that could be uh, uh, seasonal polarity it can be gender polarity it can be sexual polarity and then you know if you're heterosexual then your gender polarity and your sexual polarity are, are going to line up conveniently but but everybody has polarity yes yes you know no. whether whether it's whether you know because because a, a gay couple they don't they're the the same gender but their sexual polarity is still sparking and um, a platonic um, mixed gender couple, they don't have the sexual thing, but they have the gender thing. Um, so, so, but th those are different polarities. Or you can you can work as a heterosexual couple, and you can have them both in one place. That's just convenient. It's, yeah. uh, but polarity is is the life force. It's it's energy. It's you know the the you know plugging the plug into the wall. You have to have the 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 positive and the negative, the the plug and the hole. You, it, it, it's yin and yang. It's it's the creation and destruction, matter and antimatter. It's it's one of the the primary places where power comes from. Yes, absolutely. Now tell me, um, one of the things that people really kind of get like their nose twisted, and when I say this, I don't know, maybe this is like a literally from Portuguese expression kind of translation from Carrigan, but it's kind of like they kind of like twist their nose, like they really kind of become very uh, suspicious about. It's lineage, and this is just something that it's really particular to traditional uh, you know, Wicca. Now, tell us a little bit more about that and what that means, because some people don't really understand this. Lineage in Wicca, and it's not actually just Wicca. For example, um, mm -hmm. your 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 lineage matters in Reiki, for example. Yes, if you're absolutely. an Usui Reiki practitioner, then yes. you have to have lineage as well. So it's not just us. There's lots of people no, who, yeah. who value it. Yeah. Um, lineage means um, that you were initiated in, by somebody who had the authority to initiate you, who was themselves initiated by somebody going all the way back to Gardner yes. for a Gardnerian. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I was initiated by somebody who was initiated by somebody who was initiated by somebody who was initiated by Gardner. So I go back four generations, but I know people who go 15, 20 generations in, in Gardnerianism in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, but what it means is um, that the, the um, bona fides of being a Gardnerian are only passed from a bona fide Gardnerian. Mm -hmm. And that's because there are things in the Gardnerian tradition that have never been published. Yes. There are energies that can only be passed in person by an initiated Gardnerian. 
um, and there are secrets that can only be passed orally. Mm -hmm. They cannot be written down. Mm -hmm. And that is the energy of our tradition. And, and, and you can think of it, um, you know what I think of it like? You know when you talk about astral travel and people talk about the silver cord? Yes. And you can always find your way back to your body by following the silver cord? Yes. Lineage is a silver cord. It carries you, the individual, all the way through back to the beginning of your tradition. And without that silver cord, you are not a part of that tradition. Now, can we define tradition? What is a tradition? Well, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, um, <coughs> very bad sound to make on the radio. Sorry. <laughs> it's um, okay. <laughs> um, the, the, a tr well, a tradition, you can call it a denomination. You know, it, 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 I don't know why in, in paganism and in Wicca we started calling things traditions instead of a denomination or, or a sect or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, you know, every tradition is a form, uh, in Wicca, is a form of practicing Wicca. It's, mm -hmm. You could call it a family, you can call it a heritage, you can call it a denomination, but Gardnerians are Gardnerians, and, and Alexandrians are Alexandrians, and Georgians are Georgians, and that's, and, you know, everybody, there's, there's, there's dozens and dozens and dozens. I, I find, I don't know if you like this, this definition, I find tradition as a, pres a, a way of practicing something, um, and in this case, you know, it can be, you know, a tradition or whatever, uh, uh, um, a Wiccan tradition, but, but it can't it can be other things. I mean, it can be, you know, a tradition can be like, you know, the classic tradition of dance, you know, uh, or, you know, a cl the classic school of uh, violin, you know, it's a tradition also. So it's a procedure that it's passed from generation to generation, and it's done basically in the same way, uh, and it's passed the same way or and over the same way, not being, you know, exclusively the same exact way, but it would be very similar. There are principles or some 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 techniques that man, that maintain that are maintained, and that's why it's called tradition. You know, it's traditional for us to do a turkey every Thanksgiving, and that's exactly what a tradition is. We all do a turkey. <laughs> we don't do, you know. Wait, right. and 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 you know, that's a very interesting point. It's a really good yeah. point. And the thing is, it doesn't mean you can't ever change. Hmm. Right, but it does yeah. mean that you have a respect for yeah. not changing, Absolutely. and yeah. that you change slowly enough to be respectful of the way things were done before. You just don't Absolutely. look at some musty old antique and say, "Well, this is no good. It's old. I'm throwing mm -hmm. it away." Mm -hmm. So yeah. you might have a traditional family recipe, um, and and you're from Portugal. So mm -hmm. people who come to the United States from other countries sometimes they can't when they have traditional recipes they can't find the right ingredients. Yes, that's true. Oh, that's so true, Deborah. That's so you so have to true. adapt your traditional <laughs> recipe to yes. different circumstances, but you still respect the basis. Absolutely. And that's that's what it is. That's what it is. It's uh, it's wonderful. I I really do I I think that it's very important for us to define these terms because these are basic terms. Sometimes uh, they are taken for granted. You know, people think, oh, I know what tradition is. Oh, I know what linen. Well, maybe not. Um, and this is our um, you know your input on it, and it's absolutely amazing. Now, we do have on this book. And I'm talking, ladies and gentlemen, about The Study of Witchcraft, A Guidebook to Advance Wicca by Deborah Lipp. This is uh, her uh, last uh, in book, this, this last legacy of Le Deborah Lipp, uh, published <laughs> by Wiser Books. <laughs> and uh, you're coming out with a memory also, uh, or a biography, um, uh, about a year from now. So it's uh, I'm just looking so forward to that. Uh, but on Chapter 8, you have a lot of things like... Um, you, you have you talk about mythology, uh, then you you go through various um, uh, kind of methods of divination. You talk about astrology, tarot, um, and and again, always a recommended reading. Now, I know that some people you know ha have affinity to um, one method or another method of of divination. I know that you like the cards, don't you? I'm 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 a big <laughs> I'm passionate about the cards, <laughs> but I'm, I love the cards. But you know what? I grew up in a card-playing family, 
Yes. You know, the Lip family did not gather, but that there was a game of gin rummy or of hearts or of, <laughs> you know, double solitaire. We were always playing cards together. So the first time I held tarot cards in my hand, I was like, oh, these are for me. These feel <laughs> right in my hand. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It's just so, so important, isn't it? When we really you, you have to, it has to. It has to feel right, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know, absolutely. I, I don't think a, a good... I believe that every witch should have a method of divination that they can count on. Yes. I think that's a basic skill for a witch. Absolutely, absolutely. I really do. But it doesn't so. have to be cards. Yeah, no, it doesn't have to be cards. It can be, you know, anything else. And sometimes you bring that... Well, what is important is that you travel through time so you can travel to you know you you can see you know you can see the map of 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 life uh, and it doesn't matter what it is i mean uh, the thing is that you have to present the map to the client and you know and say you know this is what it is you have two roads here this is what's going to happen if you go to that one and this is going to happen what you go to that one and you have to choose so it's your own choice um but the thing is that you can you know, you can divine with anything. I, 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 I used to say. Yeah, you can divine. I actually did that on a bet once. You I did. Said I can, you know, bring yeah. me like ten objects, ten yeah. random objects, and I'll. And I will, I will, I, I will divine. Yeah, yeah. That's that's basically it. I can divine with corkscrews. You know what I mean? <laughs> I that can divine fun. with anything. I know. <laughs> you can spin the the corkscrew, and oh, if you right. land, you know what I mean. And it, then the yeah. where it lands, it's like yeah, in the bottle. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. no, that yeah, makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So you sure. can, uh, basically, a witch can divine with anything that will, I mean, you, you have, you, you just see it and you open yourself. To, I mean, it's just, it's, it, and you, you create your own, um, your own, um, what is it, your own symbolism, you know, on, on anything that it's, you know, uh, you know, on on the on the objects, and then you can just divine. So we kind of lost Deborah Lip right now. Um, the call just went off, but um, we'll see if we can uh, connect again with her, and if she's speaking up. I don't know. I think that she has she is on a mobile phone, so that's why uh, we're not having. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Deborah. Hello. Oh no. Nope. Nope. Lost her again. Hello, Deborah. Are you there? She's probably she probably is and she's talking to us and we don't, don't really listen to her. No. Nope. Yeah. All right. So, let's kind of try again. Let's see what uh if she's she's on or not. Let's see. Hello. Hello? No? No. Yes. Hello. Hi. <laughs> what the heck? I know. You know what it is. Two witches talking on the phone. It's not good. It's not good. No. Oh well, I'm sorry about that. Anyway, <laughs> what I was trying to say is that that the creativity that yes. you put into yes. saying, Absolutely. "Okay, I'm going to yeah. use a corkscrew," yeah. that is so important. That was one yeah. of the reasons that I had so much recommended reading and so much homework in yes. the study of witchcraft is yes. figure it out for yourself. Yes. Don't yes. have it handed to you. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, an, an, another thing that you talk about, which is absolutely amazing, um, and, and sometimes we don't really do that. Uh, people don't really put that in their books. I think that uh, the only person who actually put that in her book was Vivian Crowley. Um, it's psychology. And just, just, it's just because she is a psychologist. She is, but it's so important. Oh my God! Because because there's so many reasons. Yes. And and I talk about the reasons in the book, but but let me just give you two. One is, if you're working in a group, um, then you're dealing with different people's stuff, people's neuroses, people's issues coming up against each other, and groups blow up and fall apart all the time. Yes. Yes. And the other reason is because um, people are going to come to you for healing, and and you're going to have to have a little bit of understanding of what might be going on below the surface. Absolutely, to counsel them and to actually, you know, give advice or whatever it is that you do. You know, it's important. It's really important. 
Right. Plus, you can't you can't see the yeah. other world clearly until you see this world clearly. Absolutely, absolutely. I I, I really do. I really do. Uh, you know, sometimes don't, don't don't. Does this happen to you? What happens to me in the cards is this, Deborah. Let me just explain to you. Okay, I I have this very old deck of cards, and it's, you know, I'm I'm very I'm very um, chic, so I have. Uh, <laughs> I'm not at all surprised. <laughs> I have this French deck. It's called the Oracle of Bellini, and you know it has to be it has to be something that you know was read uh, to historical figures. So yes, it was read to Napoleon, it was read to you know Josephine, it was read to uh, Victor Hugo. I, I mean, yeah, you know, and it's beautiful, but it's completely not tarot. I mean, it's just a, you know a, a completely different set of cards, but they're very very beautiful with these medieval kind of um, uh, kind of uh, designs to it. And sometimes, this happens more than once to me, what happens with the cards is that they trigger me. All right, So I, I, I'm triggered by the cards and sometimes I don't even need to open them to tell the person you know what's going on. And uh, sometimes I just pull one card, sometimes I just pull the whole thing, and sometimes I just stop on one and I can just go from there. So uh, does this happen to you? The readings get to be very different. Like, you know, normally I do the conventional thing that you'll see in any any book. You know, I'm yes. doing this layout and each position means this thing, and that's great. Mm -hmm. But then every now and then we will go through a different, um, a different thing. Um, like, I, I had... The, uh, this is actually also a story from my forthcoming book, but <laughs> when I was in Brazil... It, it, well, because some of my best stories I had to use. Okay. I was in Brazil the first time, and I was doing readings with a translator. Um, and um, I, was, I was just... I was firing on the whole cylinders. You know, it was incredible. Like, every reading was so accurate. And this woman comes in, and um, I start laying down cards and I say, does this sound right? And she's like, no, no, that's not right. That's exactly the opposite. And every card comes out like, no, I, I can't relate to that. <laughs> and, and I knew that I was on a roll. I mean, I knew that I was in a very psychic place because I had just done a bunch of really amazing readings. Yeah. And, I, and, and I said, this isn't working. And she says, oh, this always happens to me. She says, I can never, uh, I can never get a reading. And I said, okay, stop. Here's what we're going to do shuffled up the cards, put away the reading, reshuffled them. I said, make eye contact with me. Do not look at your translator. You don't need to look at your translator for her to hear you and to translate. And do not break eye contact with me. And then I took her hand, and together with our hands touching each other, we picked a card, and we read it. And then we picked another card, and we read it. We only read five cards because it was a very slow process. Yes, yes. But those five cards were perfectly accurate <laughs> and blew her away. <laughs> and I said, okay, we've broken through. You will never, ever again have to say to anybody, um, I can't get a reading. Yes, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, that's another thing. I want to talk about Brazil because this is a very... Uh, we, we both have a very dear friend in common. Yeah. Uh, Claudine Prieto, which um, you know everybody knows, he's he's a star in Brazil, actually. <laughs> he is kind of a rock he star. He is. <laughs> he is a rock star. So, um, so he is one of the most amazing authors in Brazil. He published a series of books. I mean, it's amazing. He does this spectacular events in, in, in Rio de Janeiro and in um, Sao Paulo and, and many other places. I mean, he, he really, really works very hard. Him and his, you know, his, um, uh, his people. I mean, it's just amazing the work they put out together and it's absolutely amazing, you know, seeing the amount of people that go to these events. Um, what do you think about the people in Brazil? What is your impressions of, of the pagan community in Brazil? What, what do you think? Because this is not your first time. I mean, this is a third time or fourth time. In no, Brazil. second time. My second, so, oh, time. second I went time in 2006. And, <laughs> okay. uh, but, but, I, but I have maintained a relationship and a friendship yes. with, yes. With, uh, with the people that I met in Brazil in 2006 ever since. So when I yes. finally got back, there were like two trips that, that we started to plan and then we couldn't do, which, is, which may be the confusing part. Yes. Um, in some ways, 
they are they're very unique and in some ways they are following the pattern that the pagan community has followed worldwide yes you know one of the things in in the 1980s and 90s um i traveled all over north america mm -hmm. uh meeting pagans everywhere i mean from from berkeley to boston to to kansas city and everywhere just wherever toronto uh, all over North America, and and trends in the United States and in North America tend to follow a pattern. You know, mm -hmm. California, and then a few years later, New York, and then the middle of the United States, and then Canada. And trends tend to, to flow in that way. You know, it's the coasts, and then the middle of the country, and then north. And so... As we would travel around, and that, that's not just true of paganism, right? But, yes. but, but as we would travel around, we would see, um, depending upon where we were, different phases that paganism was going through, and we would kind of be able to predict where it was going to end because we knew where it had ended in California, you know? <laughs> yeah. And um, so, in some ways, Brazil is... is uh, the pagan community is is North America in 1985. Yes, yes, and it's growing. Um, it's growing. It's it's heavily Wiccan. Yes, you know the 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 non Wiccan pagan um, paths didn't really grow in the U.S. until the late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's so in Brazil, it's almost entirely Wiccan. It's um, everybody knows everybody else. It's growing very rapidly. Um, there are very few authors, and and it's it's all going to change really soon. But their personality as a people is just you know they're not <laughs> North American. Yeah. They are they are Brazilian. They are they are um, you know culturally just really different, and so it's taking very unique forms. And also in 1985 in North America, we didn't have the internet. Yes. So yeah. they have access to so much more information. And, and one of the things that really characterized the growth of the pagan movement in the U.S. was that scarcity of information. So that's totally different. So they are on a unique and uh, special path. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, um, there is a question here on the on the chat room. It says, "How can we lose definition of Wicca being used to any, especially if it means that every that very diverse paths with little in common become homogenized by the same label? How can we lose the definition of Wicca being used to any, especially if it means that very diverse paths with little in common become homogenized by the same level?" I, I don't I don't think that they become homogenized. First of all, I I yeah. continue to struggle to to encourage people who aren't Wiccan to find their own definition for what they are and not try to force themselves into a Wiccan mode if that isn't right for them. Yeah. But but I don't think that the diversity of the different things that people call themselves Wicca is a problem because like um <sighs> We've been talking about cooking, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so the fact that there's many, many different cuisines doesn't doesn't homogenize cooking. It diversifies cooking. Yes, yeah. You know, all of these different, um, even if it was just say Mexican food. Yes. You know. Yeah. Or yeah. or which I Indian love, food, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Or, right, or Indian food, which yeah, I yeah, love, and yeah. I used to work in a, a for a computer company, and so there were there were people from actually every different region of India and they would sit and they would talk about the differences in their recipes. Yes, yes. You know, there's one there is one woman from Delhi and there's one woman from the south and there's one woman from the north and they're all sitting around going, Oh, you cook that with butter? We fry it first and then we you know and they, they talk. <laughs> so so just because it's all Indian food and you can label it all by one label doesn't make it all the same. Yes. The diversity yes. The individuality is is still there. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Now, uh, all of these things lead us to, um, you know, um, I, I know that you love Brazil. I know that you love to be there, uh, and I do love Brazil also because you know uh, they do speak um, Portuguese. <laughs> so it's really, it's really. A, I, I never been to Brazil. 
Um, and I'm sure that it's beautiful. You told me all about it. I mean, it's just, you just love it. Um, every time it's you go beautiful. to Brazil. Yes, yes, yes. And the food is wonderful and the, and the, the juices are just amazing. Everything is just. <laughs> and the alcohol, by the way, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really good. So, and the uh, men, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. Uh, but, <laughs> but the thing is, that I really want to know. Um, I found that there is a couple of things with Brazil that, um, and I don't know if it is just Brazil. I'm I'm sure that it's other parts of the world also. There's people like that all over the world. We, we had a lot of, and I'm talking about the Alexandrians, we had a lot of problems with people that claim to be Alexandrians, where they are really not, because uh, there's no proof that they are. Um, did you have anything like that with the Brazilian, um, you know, claiming? I, I to know be... that there are there 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 are people in Brazil that are claiming to be a gardenerian who are not. Yes. Um, and that is so completely not unique to to. It's not. Um, yeah. Yeah. Brazil. Oh my God! It's all over the United States. It's all over everywhere. It's it's. <laughs> whenever you have something that people perceive to be exclusive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. they will for some reason decide that they need to legitimize themselves by dressing themselves up like that. And it, 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 at one level, it has to do with a lack of a sense of self-worth. Yes, I If think you so, really yeah. believed in yourself and in what you were doing, yeah. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't need to label it with a label that you hadn't earned. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, it's like these people who fake having college degrees. You yes, know, absolutely. I, it's the same thing. Yeah. I'm a professional, and I've written six books. Yes. And and I dropped out of college. And yes. I don't go around pretending that I have a degree, because I don't. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and because I'm honest. But you know what? There are people who, who lie and say they have a degree because of they're ashamed. I know, and, I know, I know. And, and, it doesn't and mean, it doesn't mean that they're better or worse. I mean, it's just, it's just not worth it. But you at know, the point where you start lying... Yeah, yeah, then yeah. you have something to be ashamed of. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Because you know what? I, I just wanted to say this, Deborah, and I'm sure that you you back me on this. We know who is and who isn't. We have means to actually check you out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, we. It, it takes it takes at most three days. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. The yeah. most I have ever seen it take to verify or or disprove somebody was three days. And yes. and you know we're all connected. Everybody does know everybody else, and it's important yes. to people. It's important to people who are interested in following one of the traditional paths, like Gardnerian or Alexandrian. Yes. It's important yes. for them to know yes. that they can ask around. That they can seek out to find out if somebody who's claiming to be Gardnerian is legitimate, um, that that it is not okay with us. We can't stop. You can't stop people from going around and telling lies. Yeah, you can. I mean I yeah. wish I could, but no, I can't and I don't I don't you know, it doesn't keep me up at night that I can't. But it's important for you know, your 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 listeners and your participants to know that that claims can be checked and that we will make the effort, the traditional people will make the effort to check because um, our legitimacy and our um, respect for our tradition demands that. Yes, absolutely. Yes, exactly. That's exactly. So, ladies and gentlemen, Deborah Lipp, uh, gardener and high priestess, author of um, so many books. Let me just um, let, let's go to. We talked about the study of witchcraft. We're going to go back to that, but I really want to talk about uh, other books. Uh, for instance, the Way of Four. Uh, you have the Way of Four, and then you have the Way of Four spell book. Um, and um, the Way of Four has a subtitle of creating elemental balance in your life. How important is the the way of four. <laughs> well, I think that that the four elements are the building blocks of just every magical system, and yes. and that you can just really transform your own life by by starting to examine it through the lens of air, fire, water, and earth. Yes. And I mean, there are other systems, you know, but but you can use this system and really see yourself in a new way and really find ways of balancing yourself yes. and and embracing who you are you know and enhancing that yes 
Yes. So it's 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 a wonderful book. It was released in uh, 2004, um, and it, it's just very very good. And and you know people sometimes um, kind of like dismiss um, uh, these things that are so they think basic. They are actually not that basic. Um, they're very, very important, and they are um, they have their complexity in 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 them. And it's not really uh, something that you should dismiss just because you think that it, oh, that's basic stuff. No, it's um, it's essential, as Deborah said. Uh, to uh, it's they are actually the building blocks. Now we have the way of four, um, but the spell book. Why did you do the spell book for these um, for this book? It's a companion book obviously but why did you do it well you it's it's a it's a companion book but you can read either one without reading the In, other independently yeah yeah wh when i was writing the way of four here's what happened i started thinking about everything that having to do with the elements so there's there's elemental clothing and there's elemental uh romance and there's so so uh, there's elemental Occupation. So I started thinking about all these things, and so I started thinking about elemental spells. So there's four spells in the way of four, one for each element. And I started thinking about it, and I realized there was so much to write about it that it just sort of rolled over into the next book. Yeah. Um, and, and what the way of four spell book is, and I, I kind of, I have to tell you, regret the name, because people see the name and they think, it's a spell book, it's one of those books of recipes, it's not what I want. Yes. And it's not really a spell book. There are a total of, I think, 36 spells in the book. Each spell is an illustration, an example of the lesson in how to do elemental magic that preceded it. So yes. here's how to do candle magic, because that's in the fire magic spell, right? So, here's, so we're talking, we're in the fire magic chapter. So here's candle magic, and here's a way of doing candle magic. Here's a spell. Here's a different way of doing candle magic. Here's a spell. Sex magic. Sex magic is also fire magic. Here's some things that you need to know about sex magic. Here's, you know, I don't know, 5,000 words about spe sex magic. Here's a spell. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. so on and so on throughout the book. So um, each spell in the book is actually the culmination in a lesson in how to do a particular kind of magic. Yes, yeah. And I learned a lot writing it. I really loved writing it. I experimented. I didn't do every spell in the book, but I experimented with all of the principles in the book, and I, I actually had Don Michael Craig, who wrote that magnificent book, Modern Sex Magic, oh, read my it. section on sex magic for me yes. and, and critique it. And, um, I mean, I'm very proud of it, but I, I think that um, people don't necessarily appreciate it appreciate it because they don't they don't understand what's inside of it um i've been teaching an an eight hour intensive and in how to do magic based on the material in that book and it is like one of my most popular classes now you have another one which was released before this 2003 and it's called elements of ritual and you did actually in Brazil the last time you were there um, a workshop about you know ritual and how to set up ritual, which is very important for people to know how to do it and how to prepare and everything. Um, uh, uh, how important is this? You know, and how important is to know uh, you know how to prepare, how to set up, how to you know to to be ready for ritual. I think I, this is my first book, Elements of Ritual, and it yes. is it, it remains my most popular. And I think that I wrote it because I saw this huge gap that people really didn't know how to do ritual. Because ritual <laughs> isn't cast a circle. Ritual is, you know, when you cast a circle and you're walking around the space, here's what you need to know about the physical space that will prevent you from tripping over your two feet. And yes. here's what the theology behind doing it is. And here's what the, um, the, the mysticism hiding behind that, that principle is. So everything that you do in ritual, from, from all the preparation before you start until you cast a circle, you, medit you, you ground and center, you, you consecrate the elements. Why do you consecrate the elements? How do you consecrate the elements? What does it mean? Every single bit of ritual just drilled down. And 
as far as I know, it is the only book of its kind, and it was a huge gap in the market that, that nobody had really explored ritual in that level before. And I get thank you notes from people all the time for that book, that they did not know how to do ritual until they read that book, and that is so, so meaningful to me. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, it's a wonderful book. It's absolutely amazing. Now, we do know that you're going to do a memoir um, biography slash, yeah. you know, uh, personal notes slash, you know, whatever people want to call it. But still, um, we don't have a title. You said that I, I I keep coming up with titles. I mean, we're we're still going back and forth. I came up with a title. They hated it. I came up with, you know, we're going to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the subtitle is going to be something like the, <laughs> the Life, Loves, and Travels of a Wiccan High Priestess. It's, we just yes. need a title. <laughs> yes, yes. No, that's good. That's good. So um, why did you have the necessity of doing this this biography? Why, why did you do it? Well, I turned 50 this year. Yes. And um, that it's was a, a big age. milestone. Yes, hmm? yes. It's a lovely age. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm liking it. I really am. <laughs> and it was a big milestone. And, you know, I, I, uh, um, I suffered a personal loss. Yes. You know, my son's my son's father passed away, and mm-hmm. so that was very, um, you know, I was grieving, and mm-hmm. um, so this idea of looking at my life, of going back to the beginning and looking at all the pieces and 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 revisiting it, mm-hmm. it became very uh, compelling. Yes, yes, yes. and um, partly because I'd read other memoirs, and I thought oh, I can do better. <laughs> 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 of course, yeah. That, yeah. that is true. That is yes, true. Yes, that yes. is part of what motivated me. I, yes. I I'm not proud of it, <laughs> but that was part of the process. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So and, that's and, that's, and that's, that's what it's And it became like, oh my god! And I have an incredibly well documented life. I have diaries. I have correspondence. I keep car. I have correspondence that is forty years old. I have letters and cards and. I have an incredibly well documented life, so I was able to dig through all this stuff. Yes, yes. Well, I'm sure that um, it would be a fantastic book. We were kind of like, you know, people are saying on the chat room they can't wait for it, um, you know, uh, and it's really something that we wanted to, because we really want to know you, and, and we really want to know a little bit more about Deborah Lip and what she does and everything. Now, um, any more books on the craft, or this is it? Oh, every book is the last book until I, you know, I decide what of the course. next one is. Yes. I mean, I don't know. I can't. I can't really. Um, I have to decide what it is I'm passionate about writing. Yes. I mean, I'm sure there will be more. I'm. I'm still young. <laughs> oh yes, you are, <laughs> and you're certainly. We're certainly waiting for more from you. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. No, I, I absolutely, I absolutely agree. Yes. But I can't write unless I'm, I'm really into it. Otherwise, it's just a chore. And and so I just have to figure out what the next uh, book that compels me is. I, I, I mean, it's, it's been a long time between books because there were a couple of projects that I started with collaborators, and that didn't work out. So, yeah. but that's what happens. I mean, I know, you know, I working know. with collaborators is not always easy. It's not easy. really good. It's not really fun. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just the, you know, the partnership of the century. And here's, sometimes it, here's the thing: is I write unusually quickly. Yeah. I mean, I can sit down and write a 500 word essay while I'm having my morning coffee. Yes. And and so collaborators don't really want to work with me because they they most writers <laughs> don't write at that kind of a pace and they don't know. So. I just kind of outpaced my collaborators and I became frustrated and aggravated with them and <laughs> it, it didn't work. It didn't work. So, so there are two poor, poor partial books that um, are never going to get finished that I had to move on from and that's why it's been several years between books. Yeah, yeah. Now, one of the... Um, oh, we lost, we lost her again. Let's see if we can uh, recoup again. Uh, we kind of lost her. Hello. The person you have called oh, at oh, eight. Oh, 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 oh. All right. So, okay. Let's just uh, try again. Um, wonderful to talk to uh, Deborah Lip. It's amazing. We're going to go back to the book a little bit and uh, talk about the best. She has, like, the best and worst of Wicca, and I really wanted to uh, talk about that with her because it's wonderful to know, 
you know, the best of traditional Wicca and the worst of traditional Wicca and all of that. So I really wanted to kind of go, you know, and and talk about that as soon as we have. Um, apparently we can't. Oh, uh, the call just failed. I don't know what's going on. All right. So um, let me just uh, kind of uh, put myself here on... <laughs> so that we can kind of you can see me desperate trying to recall her um making this phone call oh here we go hello i, I can't explain it i me neither it makes a little clicky sound and then it's horrible it's okay all right uh so i was talking with people about what you wrote about the best and worst of wicca and i really wanted to go through it because it's really wonderful um, especially about traditional Wicca, you just lay out, and this is on um, on one of the chapters, it's chapter two actually, about modern Wicca described, um, and you kind of lay out um, the worst and the best of traditional Wicca, the best and the worst of radical Wicca, and the best of the worst uh, of uh, eclectic Wicca. Now let's talk about traditional Wicca. What is the best things that you consider to be, and this is a sneak peek on the book because I, I like to do this. Uh, what is the best things on traditional Wicca that you think that are absolutely amazing or right, the best? Um, let's see. I, I, I kind of don't remember what it says in that chapter. Uh, I can tell you. <laughs> but you so you, you're kind of getting me. But, I, I mean, I, I love traditional Wicca, so I'm not um, um, unbiased. Yes. But the, the structure of traditional Wicca means that you always sort of know what you're going to do, and that gives you the freedom to um, uh, to be ready on a moment's notice, uh, yes. even to be able to improvise because uh, the structure is supportive. Yes. And because there is a hierarchical structure, you know that the priestesses and priests in that tradition have been trained and know what they're talking about. They're not just yesterday I discovered paganism, today I am a priestess. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so there's, there's yes. a support system of knowledge that is just so powerful. Yes, yes. Now, you talk about secrecy and oaths, and you do say that th this is one of the best things about Wicca also. Um, because you say that it, you know these these along with the difficult getting into a traditional group creates a bonding and intimacy that can be incredibly powerful and 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 profoundly enhancing coven work. Absolutely. Look, you you are in a long term committed relationship, and yeah. there's only eighty thousand people listening to you right now. So, do, would you like to share with us what you did in bed last night? Oh, absolutely no. <laughs> no, of or, course or not. Does of this, course or not. does keeping it secret make yes. it more beautiful? Absolutely. I used to say, you know, people sometimes, you know, you have those people that say, you know, um, why did you keep so many secrets? I mean, why do, why can't you just say things? I'm making a little funny voice, which is actually what they sound like. Uh, but, but it is what they say. And I said, you know, it's not because it's secret. It's because it's sacred to us. I don't want to share what it's sacred to me because it's so intimately sacred to me that, you know, other, other than if you uh, get into it in the proper way and share with me this, 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 these things and these mysteries with me in the proper way, I'm not going to tell you what it is. And it's not because it's secret. It's because it's so much sacred to me that I can't it's, really it's reveal intimate. it to you. It's you know private. I mean? it's, it's private, yes. Yes, absolutely. Well, not only that, but but it does create a bond. When I meet another gardenarian, yes. and I know and we've never met before, but I know we share the same secrets, and we honor those secrets. Yes. And I also think so So there's a bond between us. Yes. And And I also think that it creates a kind of a steel core in a person. You know, you can't get my secrets out of me. Yes. And just and I honor me, those I secrets, care. and I just can't blab when I feel <laughs> like it. And there is, yes. it, it builds something inside me. Yeah. Yes. yes. Honoring that oath that I, of secrecy that I have been honoring for, for 30 years, it yes. builds something inside of me. Yes, yes, that's absolutely. Now, wh what would you call that? What would you call that? That building? Uh, it's, that, that? It's, it's, in, it's a kind of an integrity and an honor. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I'm not saying 
by the way, I'm not saying that other people don't have not, integrity, and yes, I'm not yeah. saying that other people don't have honor. I'm saying this is one way of, of developing that within yourself. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Now, also, rules are, uh, you know, one of the things that you said that it's the best of traditional Wicca, um, because you say that they, 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 they often provide a, f a fallback position. Their best light rules help you to know what to do when you are conflicted or unsure. Yes, and rules rules are so, sort of a support system. Rules are a sort of a safety net. Yes. Yes. And and look, not everybody has a temperament where they want to be in, involved with something that has a bunch of rules. Me. I'm a Taurus. <laughs> Me too. You know, I <laughs> I like structure and I like things to be reliable. And yes. when I look at something that has structure and rules, I I know what it is. Yes. It's yes. stable. I and, have to and know I what feel it is. Supported. Yes. <laughs> I I really have to know what it is. I have to know, and I I like rules also. So yeah, but it's not for everybody, and it's fine. I mean, it's absolutely fine. Now, what do you think that it's the worst? Well, I think that um, you know the traditional Wiccans can be very rigid. They can they can they can be very well. This is the way it is, and they can't see when the rule is broken, and they can't see when. Um, when when the rule needs to be in some way opened up, I I think that um, I, I've met many traditional Wiccans who seem to go through life with blinders on. Yes. You know that they they can't they can't see that anything else but what they do is is valid or or how they've always done it. And there are even people who, and I'm guilty of this myself. You know, that there were times you thought something was a rule. It turns out it isn't a rule. But by God, you're going to act like it's a rule anyway. <laughs> <laughs> now, there is something here that you really, I really wanted to talk to you about because this is a big issue with people that actually don't really... You know, there's this... this I think that there is this um, group of people that they are intrinsically against traditional craft. They really yeah. are, and they make that a bandage, a bandage, and they 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 make it like you know a, a kind of like a, a political thing. Uh, you yeah, say they here, go around, oh, they're silly traditionalists, ha, oh, ha, ha. Oh, ha, ha. and and it's just so so. Uh, there is an item here that he said that it's uh, hierarchy can be can backfire, and this is one of the things that it's absolutely important to talk about because it relates to ego, and we're going to define what it's ego. I think that, you know, you're absolutely right. You really are. Uh, and can you talk to, uh, a little bit about that? Because that's a very important point. I think I, I certainly have seen it go to people's heads and mm. um, where they start lording it over, where it's like, I'm, I'm the high priest, I'm the high priestess, do what you're told. And in fact, if you study the Gardnerian tradition deeply, you will see that there's all these fail states built into the tradition to prevent people from behaving like that. But... They're easy to ignore, and I have, I have, I, I mean, yes, there's, there's a rule in the tradition that says you can't be a jerk, but stop and, <laughs> tell a jerk to stop and read the rules. I mean, <laughs> you know, partly it's because power has some inherent problems. I mean, you know, when you're in a in a in a, 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 a rich r ritual structure in which you're being called, you know, my lady or my lord, and you're being being treated with great respect. Um, that's a heady drug. <laughs> that yes, comes right yes, here. Yeah. Mm, that gets you high, and yeah. and so you have to do that inner work to balance yourself, not to lord it over people. That's why the psychology is important. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, that's why I always tell people they should they should consider doing some therapy because it is an enormous upset to your psyche when all of a sudden people are treating you with that kind of respect. Absolutely. And yes. and it can make you act like a jerk. And unfortunately what happens is that people get into a situation where the leader of their group is acting like a jerk. And instead of saying, Well, I'm voting with my feet, bye bye um, they stick around either because they want what that teacher has to offer, even though that teacher is being a jerk, or uh, they believe them. They believe that this is the way things are supposed to be. They've mm -hmm. been fooled. And 
um, and, and it can be very damaging and it can be very harmful. I, I have to say that I think in, in my many years in the craft that I think I have seen students do more harm to teachers than teachers do to students. Yes. Um, but but teachers have an, more of the power and have more of a capacity for doing harm. And it's just, here's the thing. If, if a teacher is, is lording it over you, is making you feel bad about yourself, is telling you that you can't have the basic freedoms that every human being is entitled to, vote with your feet. Get up, walk away. Yes, yes, absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Deborah Lipp, uh, the author of uh, The Study of Witchcraft, a guidebook to advance Wicca, with a forward by Isaac Bonowitz. And uh, it's just a pleasure to have you here talking about this, because, you know, it's it's not all um, always that we have. We, we had a, a couple of wonderful high priestesses in, in witch talk talking about, you know, traditional witchcraft. Um, but it's always a pleasure to have, uh, you know, uh, a traditional uh, Wiccan uh, high priestess talking about it, and especially when that particular high priestess uh, write a book that it's, um, you know, directly connected with, uh, with Wicca and how you can actually, you know, it, and talking about these absolutely um, very important uh, topics on, on the matter. And it's absolutely great. So, um, grab a copy. Uh, it's Wiser Books. You can get it, um, you know, on Wiser or Amazon. And um, if you are uh, doing that, by the way, you can stop by also on Llewellyn um, website and actually have a go. So since you are with your <laughs> credit card on hand, why not just buy the whole thing? So <laughs> you can buy the elements of ritual and um also the um the the, the other uh the way of the way four of four. and the way of four spell book which is just you know the whole Deborah lip experience why not right because these are <laughs> very important books um that really go in in depth into very important basic um, and crucial points on the craft, and if you are interested in traditional craft uh, or any or any other um, um, you know uh, witchcraft tradition, these are basic points that you can actually uh, really really learn a lot from. So this is wonderful. Do people work um, uh, call um, write to you a lot? Deborah, I, I get, I get, I had, yeah. Uh, yeah, pretty not not constantly. I'm not, mm. I'm not drowning under a pile of, of email, but like I had two really nice uh, letters about my writing this week, you know, and that's about you know one or two a week, and it's it's really nice. People are usually really really sweet, and like this this was helpful to me, or I'm using this uh, in a study group with with my friends, and it's very touching. I mean. You write alone. Writing is not, it's not like being a musician, you know, where you're up there on stage and everybody's clapping and you can tell <laughs> right away that you're doing good, you know? Yeah, yeah. You, you just have to um, believe that there's an audience for this. And then when it turns out that there is, that's a very beautiful feeling. Now, you have this book, which I just find out, which is the ultimate James Bond fan book. <laughs> 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 so uh, let's just go there a little bit. What is this about? I love James Bond movies. This has nothing to do with the occult. This no. is this no. is just my other thing that I do is entertainment writing. I've written a book about James Bond. I have a television blog um, called Basket of Kisses. I love entertainment writing. I love pop culture. I love TV and movies. <laughs> Yes. And and you know what? It's low stress. I mean, really, um, when you're writing about the craft, what you're writing about is something that's deeply, deeply important. So then to sit back and write about TV or write about James Bond, it's so relaxing because really, in the end, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> it's just a movie. Of and course. there is something so freeing for me as a creative person. To, so to you're a fan. That. Are you a fan of James? Oh, of course, you are a fan of James. I am the ultimate James Bond fan. Of course, that's how you the book are. Got its name. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, tell me one thing. What about what about these? I mean, James Bond is one of those movies, and they attempt they attempt to do this with the Bourne movies. 
Um, born this, born that. Um, the James Bond 007, the ultimate, um, you know, secret agent uh, in service of Her Majesty, the Queen of England. Now, tell me, um, do you agree with it? What What is your favorite? Because there are so many actors doing these uh, roles well, over these three. Do you like the latest one? Do you think that I he love got... Daniel Craig? I love right, Daniel Craig. Okay. I think he's doing an amazing job. I was <laughs> such a doubter when yes. he was first announced. Yes. Yes. When he was first announced that Pierce Brosnan was out and this new guy was in, I was I was furious. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was. That was actually what started me b- blogging. Yes. That was actually when I first started blogging. Was that I was so mad about Daniel Craig that, <laughs> that I started a blog. <laughs> and 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 of course the title of my blog, Property of a Lady, that's a James Bond reference. Yes. Um. But um. He's he's incredible. Casino Royale is a great movie. Quantum of Solace, ah, eh, not so much. It's not a bad movie, but it's not a great movie. Yes. But I'm very excited about Skyfall, which is coming out in November. And yes, I, my, favorite, my favorite James Bond movie is From Russia With Love, 1963, Sean Connery. Yes. Great movie. Yes. That's my favorite movie. Yes. And I have seen that, I don't even know how many times. I can recite <laughs> it along with the screen. <laughs> <laughs> now tell me, what is your favorite James Bond? Um, I mean... <sighs> You kind of have to give it to Sean Connery. He was yes, the first. I, he I was magnificent. Yes. But I think that um, Pierce Brosnan was an amazing actor, and he did some very good movies. Do you know the name of the first one, the very first one before him? Before, it was this one-time thing. Oh, you're talking about the Casino Royale television show on, on Climax Theater on CBS in 1954. Absolutely. Do you know that guy? Do you know the name of the guy? I I don't and remember. I, it is, it is on the tip of my tongue, <laughs> and it was actually, um, it was actually, um, in it, he was playing the American agent Jimmy Bond is what yes. it was, and yes. Felix Leiter, who in um, most of the. Um, uh, most of the movies, Felix Leiter is is the American agent who is um, who is James Bond's like connection. Yes. Um, Let me see if I can. He find he it was out. actually uh, not like he was Clarence Leiter, the British agent. Um, yes. In this, and so they switched it. You know, so it was American Jimmy Bond, and I can't remember the actor's name. It's right on the tip of my tongue. When I was doing so much uh, radio appearances for that book, when that book first came out, I knew all of this stuff by heart. But you I know, know what? I, know. I, I turned I know. fifty. It, it <laughs> ruins your brain. <laughs> no, I know that there is a scene on the first movie, right? And that guy just did it for one one time and one time only. That was it. Right. That was, um, that was. Oh, it was Barry Nelson. Barry Nelson. Yes, yes, yes. So he, there is this scene on the James movie, on the James Bond movie. That movie. I don't know the name of the movie. Now this was but, not. Now this. Now the first James Bond movie with Sean Connery was Doctor No. Nelson. So this is this is this is the series then. So that that's the series, right? The television series. Well, this was done? just no. The, what this was was there was a TV show on in the 1950s yeah, in show. which they would do one-hour plays. Yeah. Single, uh-huh. you know, every week it was a different thing, and they, so there was only just the one. It wasn't a series. It was there was only one James Bond for that one hour for one episode of this series called Climax on on CBS in 1954. Uh-huh. I uh, what I'm remembering is this scene. I think it's on Casino Royale. I really do. Um, and well, it's it's it, it's not on the latest one, but it's uh, I don't know. They did the first one somehow. I don't know. But there is this scene where there is this trap. I mean, he's racing with this car on a winding road with the sea. Be you know the sea, You can see the sea, and it's kind of this winding road uh, on the coast of the sea, and that's actually Portugal. And oh, I've, interesting. Do you I, know didn't, that? I didn't know that it was actually Portugal, but that it is, is Portugal. It is Portugal. Oh, are and you the... talking? Okay, wait. There's two different scenes. The one is you're thinking about the casino. You're talking about the 1954 Casino Royale, or you're talking about Goldeneye with Pierce Brosnan. I think so. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Because there is this scene where he is in Portugal. I mean, the whole thing is Portugal, 
nobody knows that it's Portugal, but it is, and and that's actually the the one of the one of the roads that uh, leads uh, Lisbon to Cascais, which is like uh, a coast kind of uh, very chic. Um, and with you know all of that coast of Lisbon, it's full of mansions and you know small castles. It's just beautiful, and 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 he's racing you know with this very sporty car. And right, right, and then that that's the beginning of Goldeneye. That's the beginning of Goldeneye. I think that's Goldeneye. Goldeneye. He's, yes, I think that's Goldeneye. I think it is. He is. Um, uh, there's a, there's a funny bit of trivia about that. He's yes. racing in the in the 1964 Aston Martin, <laughs> in the classic Aston Martin, and she's yes. in a um, a Ferrari. Yes. And Ferrari yes. company would only let them <laughs> use their car in the movie if the Ferrari won. You you cannot race the Ferrari against an Aston Martin and have the Aston Martin win. We won't let you use the Ferrari. <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Marginal, so, exactly. So she That's actually the did win yeah. in that movie. It's called the Marginal. Marginal. It's the 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 the, the road that he's riding in. And uh, which connects Lisbon to Cascais, and it's absolutely amazing because you know they stop the traffic for him to actually ride, you know, and it's a winding road in a coast, so it's very beautiful. You can see the you know the the sea and everything, and it's kind of like amazing. It's really amazing, and um, yeah. So there you go. <laughs> Did you know that? You didn't know yes, that. Yes, I Deborah didn't know Lev. that. But you know, I think it's pretty good that you said <laughs> car chase, and I was able to figure out which movie you were talking about. Yes, <laughs> I know. That's I know, not I know. a lot of clues. <laughs> <laughs> I know, ladies and gentlemen, Deborah Lip, the study of witchcraft, a guidebook to advanced Wicca, and now we're talking about, uh, you know, Double uh, O Seven, and um, you know, Deborah's one of Deborah's passions, um, <laughs> secret passions, right? Uh, it's not that secret. I guess but, once you, you know, publish a book, it's not really secret. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not. But it's it's wonderful to know a little bit about you, you know, beyond the craft. And, you, you know, it's wonderful. Now, Property of a Lady. Tell us a little bit about this. This is Deborah Lip goes on about Wicca, politics, paganism, and cats. Not necessarily in that wor- order. So wh- what, I- what is this um, blog about? Everything and it's everything? Basically, it's basically my personal blog. And sometimes... Sometimes I'm talking about ritual, and sometimes I'm talking about, um, uh, you know, the current holiday or whatever, um, and, and you know, pagan issues. For a while, I was doing a, a weekly meditation that lasted for, probably for, for several months that, there, that I did a Sunday meditation. And sometimes it's just me talking about my personal life or, you know, my battles with Netflix and you know, whatever. No, there is one here. Let me just show oh, you. Oh, please. There were like three on that Netflix thing. It just Netflix went on and on. Netflix hates its customers. <laughs> yeah. I know. For people World's who don't worst know. customer or, service. I think, I think that Netflix is reaching... Um, Europe right now, Spain especially. I don't think that it, they got it in Portugal. They really certainly got it in the UK. Um, it's reaching now the Europe. So if you don't know what it is, well, basically it is a video club um, by mail. So and you can actually stream it also in your computer all, uh, or in your TV directly if you have um, TV that it's directly connected with the internet. So that's what it is. And yes, they don't they don't have a good uh, customer service. Yeah, they mm. used to have a great customer service, um, mm. but. Um, uh, <laughs> I had some trouble with them recently, and I just went to my blog to complain. Because what is the purpose of blogging if you can't complain? Of course, you have to kind of, you know, say what you know. It's in your soul. What's in your soul? So, um, uh, it's just. <laughs> why is there an int- an entry here that says "loser," and it says, "In preparation for my trip to Brazil, I've been studying Portuguese." <laughs> this is so good. And she says, last night I was fascinated to realize that the verb in the lose weight, the verb in the lose a game, and the verb in to be lost are all the same perder. Okay, sure, they're all the same in English too, but there's no inherent reason. (laughs) Why should they be the same in another language? I I thought it was fascinating. It is, it is. And perder, perder, it's, it's it's the... they say it a little bit different in Brazil, but in Portuguese it's uh, but it's the same thing. It's the same word. Um, yeah, yeah. It's to lose, to lose, to lose somebody, to be lost. 
uh, or to lose, to lose weight, weight or to yeah. um, lose a contest or to get lost yeah. when you're when you're driving around. Because yes. those are really, yeah. if you think about it, those are all really different meanings. Yeah, they are. They are well, well but it's lose. It's always lose something. Right. So it's always lose. Weight, it's lose, always lose in Portuguese. You know, but you could imagine if you if you made up a language, you could imagine that one word <laughs> that had something to do with direction. <laughs> <laughs> and one word that has had something to do with a contest would not be the same. No. But the thing is that um, we're very economic, so we can't really lose many words. For, so you, we use a lot of words, for the, uh, one word for, the, for, for many things, and you have to figure it out by the context, and that's basically it. You know what I mean? I, so, I, I just love language, <laughs> and one of, one of the ongoing things... Um, on property of a lady is me going, oh, that was an odd phrase I heard, or, or you know, just thinking about mostly about English. And, <laughs> and so, while I was studying Portuguese, which I have to get back to because I've, I've, I never got really good, but, but it, it, it goes away so fast if you don't keep practicing. Um, I know, I know. <laughs> it was so difficult. I mean, the longer I was in Portugal, I, I wasn't in Portugal. The longer I was in Brazil, Brazil the less. Yeah. Portuguese, I spoke. It was like I always got harder and harder instead of easier and easier because I kept trying to say what I knew how to say, and then sort of people give you that look like, "Oh, isn't what that cute? About? She's trying to talk." <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Oh uh, no, I know that you ask for um for. Clementines, right? Clementines? That you, you, you asked that in Brazil, and nobody knew what it was. Oh, no, not clementines. Go, go, grapefruit. Well, nobody oh, knows grapefruit. what grapefruit Okay, is. okay, all right, all right. So it was grapefruit, and I think that is in Portuguese, and people in the chat room, please help me. Uh, grapefruit is that orange that it's very big and very, when you cut it on the middle, it's very kind of um, bloody red. I think Right, it's, and it's uh, also kind yeah. very sour. Yeah, it's very sour. Yeah, it's very sour. So I think that that has a name. And the other day I said to Jamal, and I don't remember the name now, but um, we do have it in Portugal, and I'm sure that they have it in Brazil. What what was they the word that they used? They, oh, they, they don't have it in Brazil. They don't have it in Brazil. And and what? this was the thing is is I was taking my language lessons, and so they said, yeah. "What do you eat for breakfast?" So I said, exactly. "You know, I drink." Uh, and I it's looked called, up in a dictionary. It's called turanja. T -O -R Turanja, yes. Uh, yeah, Turanja. T O R A N G J A. So Turanja. Right. So I said I I I don't normally eat breakfast. I normally just <laughs> drink uh, sucre de Turanja. And they come and they leap right in and they correct me. No, no, you mean sucre de laranja. No, I don't. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's not the same. Fruit. It's really it's not. not. No, no, it's not. It's not. It's not. Now, if you send that in Portugal, I'm sure that they will give you one. Yeah, suco de turanja. And we don't really say suco in Portugal. This is a difference between Portuguese from Portugal and a Portuguese from Brazil. They say suco, which is S U C O. Um, mm -hmm. We say sumo, which is S U M O. It's the same thing, but it's a different word for the same thing. So we don't really use the suku. Suku is typical Brazilian, typical. So we don't use the same. We say sum de turanja, which is the the or sum yeah, de. Yeah, I had to actually um, the first uh, like the language um, <laughs> MP3 file that I bought. <laughs> it was Portuguese. Um, it was Portuguese. It was continental Portuguese. Oh really? You're Portuguese, and oh. and I, oh, this is not going to work because I have to keep because the pronunciations are so different. So I had to get <laughs> yes. a second language lesson to <laughs> supplement. Well, it, they will, they will, uh, they will understand, but they say that we kind of um, their their language is very musical. They really kind of almost like sing it. You know, it's very, it's the same difference between British English and American English. Right, which can be significant. I mean, we do absolutely. understand each other. Absolutely, absolutely. We yes, we do yes. understand each other, but then other times yeah. we're like, "What the heck?" I know. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, um, we're, ta- we're we're way beyond the craft, but it's always a pleasure, and it's always good to know a little bit about you out outside of the, of the craft. Uh, wonderful book, Deborah Lip, The Study of Witchcraft, a guided book to advance Wicca. There is a book coming out, her memoirs. Um, there's no um, title yet, but about a year from now, it's coming out. Is it a Wiser book or a Llewellyn book? It'll be a Llewellyn book. It'll be a Llewellyn right. book. Okay. And um, we've been working on a title. We've been working on um, illustration. <laughs> I've been putting together old photos from my personal photo oh, album, which will be a lot of fun, right. I think. Yes. And, yes. you know, just uh, um, watch watch my blog and you'll see announcements. So let me just tell you the blog. Um, it's called uh, uh, the Property of a Lady, and it's www.debralip.com/slash WordPress, and it's uh, Deborah Lip. It's D E B O R A H. So Deborah, and then Lip L I P P dot com. All right. So that's the that's the thing. And then you can actually go to Deborah dot com, which is the same thing. Uh, but um, you can access the blog from there also, and you can actually buy the book from uh, Deborah's uh, website. And and you know you have a wonderful website. I love the photographs. The poses are just brilliant. I just love the you know your photographs. I don't know if you know. I, I, you're going to see it the the show later on. I actually took a photograph of you, turned it into black and white, make a little bit of Photoshop magic, and there you are. So you're going to kind of check that out and see if you like oh, it. Oh, how nice. Yeah. <laughs> so you have a lot of uh, workshops and talks. We have to talk about this because you are available to do these. Um, and, and let me just go through them. I mean, talks on ritual and magic, and you do have talks on gods and myths. Um, the nature of deity, who and what are the gods, how to worship the gods, becoming a deity, Snow White, the Wicked Witch, and female power. You have a lot of things. I love this one, Persephone, uh, Demeter, Persephone, and Hades. Um, and then you have talks on ritual and magic, uh, the structure of which Wiccan ritual, which I believe that was um, one of the things that you did in Brazil. Did you or preparing for ritual? What was that? I did preparing for ritual. In all right, all right, yeah, yeah. And the use of voice. Pain manage, ma- management for pagans, the structure of spell casting. You have so many things. It's just amazing. Talks on Wicca. So, people, just go to www.debralip.com. If you happen to have um, an event, and it doesn't matter where in the world, um, you can actually talk to Deborah and ask her to attend your um, your uh, your workshop or, or to do a workshop on your event, and she will be more than glad to. I, do you have any restrictions about traveling? You can travel anywhere, right? I can travel anywhere. Um, I mean, the only <laughs> thing is, you know, I do have a day job, like like yes. most uh, writers. Um, yes. So my my travel my available travel time is is limited. Yes. So you know, it's get your bid in early. I love traveling. I love meeting people. I love I I love it. I I think it's wonderful that I have this this fantastic opportunity as a result of of the writing that I do to be able to meet people all over the world and and it's you know every trip to me is a thrill. Now, another very kind and generous uh, thing that Deborah put in her website, it's a section that is called Recommended Reading, and you have things like from Introduction to Wicca, and then you have like three books, and then you have History of Wicca, How-To Books, Practicing Wicca, and uh, I mean, it's just amazing. People would, you know, you have so many other authors in here that, you know, they're not, you know just your books, which, you know, you have your books here, but it's not just your books. You have other people's books, which is absolutely amazing. It's very generous from you, um, of you. Books on magic, self-actualization, uh, books on gods, goddesses, and myth. So, uh, really, if you really want a guidebook to Wicca, I think that this is absolutely an amazing site, and you do keep up with it. I mean, you know, I, I, I interviewed so many people that sometimes we go to the website, and it's just not not <laughs> you know it's there's nothing in there <laughs> it's about them well, it's and it's hard to update the site and and I know. you know mm. on, yeah. on the, my list of things to do sometimes that falls off uh, 
you know, but I do try to at least, uh, I mean, you will find things on that website that are out of date, uh, to be honest, but um, I'm always accessible. My email address is there. People can contact me, um, and, uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm, easy to find actually i'm i'm really easy to find i mean if you if you if you google me i'm the first i'm the first uh thing that comes up i mean if you put my name into google you get my website you get my blog and and you can find me and um it's very direct i'm yeah. always i'm always happy to to hear from from people that's great that's great well deborah thank you so much for being here on witch talk it's just a pleasure to talk to you and thank you so much for your generosity to actually share with us your insights on your books and in your life and we're going to know all about you from a year from now because you're going to release your biography with pictures and things so we're going to get into deborah lips a little bit more in a year and i'm sure that we're going to get back to you and you're going to be on Witch Talk again with your memoir the next time. Oh, that'll be uh, great, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. I would love to have you back. And I'm sure that everybody, you know, would love to have you back. People, uh, these are the five minutes, the last five minutes. So if you have any questions for uh, Deborah, just go right ahead and ask now or else, um, you know, be silent forever. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> you can just kind of like, you know, you can send her an email. <laughs> just go to her website. And again, um, let me just say to you what the website is. Again, www.deboralip.com. And that's D E B O R A H L I P P.com. All right. So that's, um, uh, that's, the, that's the thing. So thank you very much. Don't go anywhere, Deborah. Um, just, I'll be uh, right here. Yes, just hang on because I'm going to talk to you a little bit afterwards. Thank you so much for being here on Witch Talk and thank you so much for your generosity and to share all Thank of you these. for having me. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. Thank you very much. So that was it. Thank you, everybody that is in on Witch Talk, on the chat room. It's absolutely amazing have you all here um, and um, thank you very much for Mimac from Portugal, Cynthia Cassandra from Portugal, also uh, Turner and Bafo from um, uh, Turner from the United States thank you so so much it was a wonderful wonderful show thank you for, for, for being here on the chat room I'll see you next week with more Witch Talk, until then have a wonderful wonderful week, bye bye